Hi, my name is Rob Zimmerman. I'm with Resiliency Initiatives, and we're here talking to Don Barber. He's the principal at Terry Fox Junior High School here in Calgary about strength-based practice in schools. So, Don, thanks for being here. Um, so, what do you see as the role of, of schools in, in adopting strength-based practice? Basically, we really start off with uh, a one significant statement at, at Terry Fox School, and it's everybody will do their best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we all have the capacity to do that. And if you actually believe that everybody has strength, then setting that scenario out there that we, all we have to do is commit to each other that we're going to do our best. Yeah. Teachers, students, administration, support staff, everybody, and even our parent group and our stakeholders. Are we all supporting students by doing our best in whatever capacity mm -hmm. um, we bring to the school environment? then really we are a strength-based school mm -hmm. because automatically you're saying to everybody that I believe uh, there's competency within you, mm -hmm. I believe there's value, and I believe that given opportunities to perform at your best, you will be successful. A strength-based teacher looks at students first in the context of the curriculum that they're teaching as opposed to looking at the curriculum first. Mm -hmm and then seeing how students are going to fit with that curriculum. Strength-based teachers interested in relationships and interested in developing relationships and again different from developing relationships because they want people to like them. Mm -hmm. They're interested in developing relationships because they recognize that a caring, supportive, genuine relationships with students uh, will allow them first of all to understand students better because I understand a student better, I can now program for that student um, in more appropriate ways mm -hmm. that actually does consider their story, considers uh, past experiences, considers learning styles, considers um, the strengths that they bring to the classroom and really builds on those. There's a general model in education, it's called the Universal Design for Learning, and it's an architectural idea that says if you build a building and you recognize that lots of different people are going to be using that building, then build the supports for those uh, individuals before they show up. Classic cases, we generally don't have too many government buildings or buildings any without, that aren't wheelchair accessible, because for the life of that building, you're probably going to have that clientele show up. In education, we do the same thing. And so when we look at school program, when we look at if our intention is to develop relationships with students and facilitate in that relationship growth and development and support for the whole individual, then we need to bring on some other community partners that support different aspects of that person. Mm -hmm. So under the Universal Design for Learning model, we've actually sought out uh, community support that we rely on in our building and external to our building so we can further enhance our relationship with those community partners in um, supporting students and their families in ways that allow them to be ready to learn. We invest a lot of money, uh, or a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of um, expertise in negotiating supports for students that we can see students uh, requiring throughout the year. We recognize that students will uh, meet many challenges if we really are trying to extend um, their capacity to, to grow. Um, and if we can be proactive in having the supports available to students when they need the support as opposed to reactive when the crisis occurs what we find is a challenge for a student can be mitigated and it becomes it never gets to crisis it's certainly a challenge that needs support um, and some work to move through but it never hits crises it never hits that that point where growth potentially stops or is on hold um, because what you'll find as well is that if you wait for a crisis to occur, you, the support that's necessary generally is not available to you immediately, mm -hmm. and therefore the crisis gets to exist for a period of time and generally grows. I think that a lot of schools uh, look at a compliance um, 
they use compliance as a term to gain success. So, and compliance just means I don't have problems, right? Um, what we use as a, as a gauge is not necessarily compliance. Compliance really doesn't come into it for us because there's multiple ways to gain compliance. Uh, some people believe through power and enforcement. Um, other people would believe through um, avoidance. What we're talking about is actually engagement. And I think so we totally avoid the compliance issue altogether. We look at our students engaged in a process of, of self-development. Do we have the relationships in our building that promote that development for students? Do we understand enough about each other to facilitate experiences and processes and relationships that allow us to grow, learn, and develop? I know that at certain points in time there's some administrators that really talk about um, if I never see a student or never hear from a student that I'm running an effective school because they're staying out of trouble. I talk to students all day long. I'm actually very involved in the student population. I want to know about students. I want to know what um, is working for them, what's not working for them, where they're struggling, how I can support them. So when we talk about class exclusions, we actually have appropriate class exclusions because what we're saying is that right now, whatever results, what's ever happening in that scenario has gone beyond somebody in that um, situation's capacity to deal with the situation and they need some support around that. It's support that says, I believe in you and I recognize that to move forward, this is what you require right now. It doesn't suggest that somehow you're less of an individual because you need the support right now. Mm -hmm. What we find in uh, schools that are able to um, use uh, strength-based practice with uh, very high expectations is you generally find the expectations in this school, for instance, is much higher than other schools in the same community. Students generally, upon coming to the school, would generally um, indicate that it's very strict and there's very high expectations. What they also say quite early in their, um, in their time with us is that they, they seem to get a lot of support and acknowledgement about what they're doing well, which actually motivates them to take more and more mm -hmm. risks as they proceed. As they take more and more risk, gain more and more success, they actually start to build that confidence and actually you'll find that the support they require actually diminishes. So we just choose to put in a lot of work with most of our students really at the start, so they're starting to identify their strengths. They're starting to recognize that there is support there should they be trying their best. So we really look at almost everything in our relationship as, um, as information, mm -hmm. as an aspect of that relationship, an indication of a strength or an indication of further support. And then we move forward with that student based on that information. This is one of the bases of strength-based practice really speaks about having high expectations. And really what high expectations indicate from a strength-based practice perspective is I believe that you're capable. Yeah. Right? If I have no expectations for someone, that's a huge statement. Yeah. It says I don't expect anything from you because either life circumstances, my belief in you, or my belief in your ability indicates that I can't expect much more than what I'm currently getting. Mm -hmm. So by virtue of that, strength-based practice actually suggests that we hold realistic but high expectations of people. Mm -hmm. We would have teachers certainly establish that for their classrooms, that they should really be aware of what are the expectations for those students, what are the expectations that they have for those students, mm -hmm. uh, that those expectations should be um, realistic, but certainly high expectations. Mm -hmm. uh, they need to be aware of them, and then they need to really be able to communicate those to students, um, so students are really clear around them. And then have mechanisms by which uh, students are then held accountable around that. So we start removing barriers for them to be um, healthy, respectful individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and we increase the support where necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we talk about, the high expectations. So in, in our buildings, we have very high expectations for students. We have a very specific school code of conduct. Students are expected um, to do certain things um, basically take care of the main, their main roles as students first and then be, from that all of those other opportunities that are available to them at school actually stems from that. Mm -hmm. Often you hear of the student that we didn't uh, 
the, especially the at-risk student, that we didn't, we never consequenced music for them because that's what gets them to come to school. We never consequenced them with this athletic program because that's what gets them to come to school. Various examples of that. What we say is, no, we're, we certainly wouldn't um, exclude them from any of those activities either. Mm -hmm. But there's some things that we need to take care of in order for that activity to be appropriate at this time and learning would be one of them. Mm -hmm. The difference here is that we don't then just send them away and say go take care of that on your own. Right. What we do is have a discussion around what might some of those things be mm -hmm. that are really essential that we need to take care of right now. Yeah. We really discuss with the student what's that like for them, do they agree with that, is that certainly something that's essential that we need to be working on as a mechanism to involve yourself in all of these other areas that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. And then we sit and we sit and we discuss and what do we need, what is your responsibility in that and then how can I support you in that. Yeah. So it's less about go take care of that and come back when you're all better. Right. It's more right. of let's take care of this together and let me know mm -hmm. when you need some support right. and we'll provide that for you. But we yeah. both need to be working on this together and moving forward. I need to see that you're working on that and I suspect that you're going to want my support at certain times too. Right. It's more do what I do. So I actually take a real big initiative in all schools around really um, modeling strength-based practice. I model it how I deal with staff. I model how I, 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 I deal with students. I often invite teaching staff initially into my interactions with students in the office. So should an, a teacher exclude a kid from a class, oftentimes I actually will wait to deal with that situation um, to have the teacher present so the teacher can gain some understanding of how that relationship mm -hmm. developed, where yeah. that student um, was having some difficulty, how that student might have been supported differently Mm -hmm. to arrive at a, at a, at a different response. So right. again, we really talk about where, in that re where am I negotiating that relationship right. to move us both forward in our understanding of each other and what we need in order to, uh, mm -hmm. to do what we need to do. Over time, what we see is that teachers with that modeling actually are able to, to go into their classrooms and um, support students differently themselves, mm -hmm. right? That, that it becomes in their capacity to do so. Right.